Good afternoon and welcome to today's EHS Today webcast, Machine Safety, Incorporating Interlocking Switches and Other Safety Devices, sponsored by PILS Automation Safety. My name is Nicole Stempak. I'm Managing Editor with EHS Today and your moderator for um, this webinar. Before we begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if at any time you are having audio difficulties or slides are not advancing, simply hit your F5 key to refresh your webcast console. If you are running pop-up blocking software, you will need to disable it to view this webinar. If you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please press the question mark help button in the upper right corner to receive assistance in solving common issues. This webinar technology allows you to resize the presentation by clicking the maximize icon in the upper right corner to enlarge the window. We welcome your participation during today's event. Simply type into the ask a question window on the left side of your screen and then hit the submit button. We'll be answering as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but please feel free to send in your questions at any time and we'll add them to the queue. Please also be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the EHS Today website within the next day for you to review. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. When the webinar ends, please take a moment to complete the feedback form that will appear on your screen. And now I would like to welcome today's speaker. Maury Katz is a technical trainer at PILS. Maury grew up in South Texas. He's an Air Force veteran of the Gulf War and has been an electromagnetic electromechanical technician for over 21 years, working in various industries, including building, maintaining, and caring for all types of automated equipment. Uh, he loves animals, extreme sports, reading, and continual learning. Maury has been with PILS for a little over three years as a technical trainer and enjoys working in the field of safety with the motivation to promote and encourage all levels of safety to protect personnel and equipment. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Maury uh, so he can give his presentation. Hello, everybody. Good day. Again, my name is Maury Katz. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is our pre presentation, the EHS presentation, Machine Safety, Incorporating the Interlocking Switches and Other Safety Devices. I uh, hope you all are ready, so here we go. So the ideology behind this presentation, we're ensuring employee safety and maintaining cost-effective production of are always priorities for any manufacturing industry. The requirements for safeguarding of machinery is constantly evolving, especially with the increasing use of automation. So this evolution has also allowed the development of numerous protective devices to be integrated into systems such that they actually exist in the productivity and are no longer thought of as cost, a cost hindrance. So this webinar will focus on the standards associated with machine guarding and examples of new technology in machine guarding arena. So we'll go over objectives. So we'll review, like once again, we're going to review the standards involved, just cover briefly. We're going to provide an understanding of the application requirements of guards, safety, and the safety measures, and overview of machinery protective devices. So example, and we'll also show you examples of electrical interlocks and other safety devices. So to begin with, our relevant machinery standard, we're looking at ISO 1200 for risk assessment. So this standard establishes general principles intended to be used to meet the risk reduction objectives. These principles be bring together knowledge and experience of the design, use, incidents, accidents, and harm related to machinery in order to assess the risk posed during the relevant phases of, life, of the life cycle of the machine. This is a brief overview here of ISO 1200 and how to make a selection and implementation of the guards and protective devices that you would like to use on your machines. Here's some or more applicable standards. We have ISO 14120, general requirements for design and construction of fixed and movable guards. ISO 14119, interlocking devices associated with guards, principles for design and selection. And ISO Technical Report 24119, evaluation of fault masking of serial connections of interlocking devices associated with guards with potential free contacts. ISO 13855, Position of safeguards with respect to approach speeds of parts of the human body. ISO 13857, safety distances to prevent hazardous zones from being reached by upper and lower limbs. 
And we have ANSI B1119, Performance Criteria for Safeguarding. And of OSHA 29 CFR 1910, their general industry regulations, subpart O, machinery and machine guarding. This includes 1910-212, general requirements for all machines, 1910-217, mechanical power presses, and 1910-219, mechanical power transmission apparatuses. Now, protective devices shall be used consistently with the manufacturer's instructions and shall be applied to prevent access to the hazard. We like to use the term auto, around, under, through, and over. So we also want to prevent the cause or uh, use for the cause the hazard to cease before access, prevent unattended operation, contain parts and tooling, just in case something comes loose or may fly out, and control other process hazards like noise, laser, and radiation. So note, each protective device may not address all criteria above. So depending on the hazard being protected, multiple protective devices may be required. So types of protective devices, looking at pullbacks and mechanical restraints to begin with. Mechanical, solu mechanical solutions that prevent access to cycle initiation by interconnecting of or interlocking means. We have interlocking guards, automatic screens and doors, rotate, rotating tooling and fixtures, and other means. Of those types of protective devices, we also have electrical solutions that create a stop signal or, or presence, presence sensing devices, such as photoelectric, optical, light curtains, multiple and single beam systems, area vision radar systems, and hydraulic press brake safeguarding systems. They also have pressure sensing devices like floor mats, safety edges and bumpers, and then also control devices like two-hand control, two-hand trip, and single control devices. Continuing safeguard, a barrier is a safeguard, sorry, is a barrier device or safety procedure designed for the protection of personnel, such as guards like mechanical barriers or protective devices, safeguards other than guards, such as interlocking devices, safety light curtains and screens, single, multiple, and sorry, single and multiple beam safety systems, also area scanning protective devices, RF capacitance protective devices or radial frequency, if you will safety mat systems, and two-hand control systems. We also have, we're also going to look at the types of guardians, guardians and interlocking. So back to fixed guards, we have enclosing guards and distance guards. And we have removable guards. So these could be power operated, they could be self-closing, and they control guards. There are some that are adjustable, and they have some with interlocking guards and interlocking guards with guard locking. Guard types, we're going to look at the fixed guards to begin with. So fixed guards must be kept in place permanently, either by welding or held with fasteners that are removed only with the use of tools, not to be used like with a coin or a nail file. So you want to use the type of hardware to prevent that type of access. And you have climbing on. You do not want people to climb on the guards, so that should be prevented and inhibited as best by its design. And you have removable guards where only in, in frequent access is required. So they must be able to get in and get out but, and, but put into place with their fixings. Or sorry, they should not be allowed to be put back into place without their fixings. So you're able to contain that, any hazard that might be ejected from the enclosed area. And then if you're using distance guards, they do not completely enclose danger zones, but which prevent or reduce access by virtue of their dimensions and their distance from the danger zone. So interlocking guards. They prevent access during hazardous portions of the cycle or remove the hazard when the guard is open. So they must be observed safe mounting distance, used when access is occasional, interface to the machine control system with mechanical devices such as trap key interlocking or captive key or transfer key, if you will, or other electrical devices, key operating switches, guard locking, solenoid locking type switches, pin switches, limit switches, magnetic, optical, and RFID switches. Interlocking portion of movable guards. The hazard being guarded cannot be placed in automatic operation until the interlock guard is closed and will stop if the guard is open while the hazard is present. The closing interlock guard shall not by itself restart automatic operation. The resuming automatic operation shall require a deliberate action outside the safeguard space, such as hitting the reset button and then the start button. The switch must be tamper resistant and not easily defeated with, without tools. So you want your equipment to be really hardy 
In locking portions and removal guards, when full body access exists, it must be capable of being easily unlocked from the inside of the safeguard space with or without power available. So spare keys and actuators should be supervisory controlled and not readily available. So applicable considerations to, to put into place. So how to protect equipment with long rundown and stopping times. Some examples there on the right. So you use guard locking and interlocking devices. Install braking devices to achieve a faster stopping time. Or position the safeguard at a distance far enough away to prevent access before the hazard motion is stopped. So some examples, like I said, right there on the right, showing the, those different ideas. So mechanical devices, such as trap key interlocking switches, work on the principle that no one key can be in two places at the same time. So the system can be configured to ensure a predetermined sequence of events takes place so which key goes where and when, and used in many hazardous environment locations because it is strictly mechanical system. So the advantages and disadvantages. The advantages of mechanical devices are strictly mechanical operation and can be used in hazardous locations if required. They can be uniquely coded if, if you need that type of security. So they can be made of stainless steel or brass housing, no springs or cams that can fail. Some have replaceable coded key barrels that can be updated, they require less space if needed with access control, and provide absolute protection if regularly maintained. They have little to no wiring necessary, so lower insulation costs. Disadvantages, the complex systems can get expensive. You can end up losing or missing your keys, and access to areas can be difficult for maintenance or unloading and loading operations. For some reason, the slide is not showing itself. There's a picture there. Forgive me. Okay. It was a guard locking switch of uh, the picture. My apologies. Um, the guard cannot be opened while a hazard exists or until the machine has stopped operating. So useful when the stop time may be too large due to the operation of the inertia of the machine. So it can only be used with a solenoid. Key operated switch, the safety switch. The key is attached to the guard and is not released by the solenoid until the control system signals that, it, that a safe condition has been achieved. So you receive a safe signal and then it will disengage. There are two types, you have power to lock and power to unlock. Some examples here of some other guard locking switches. We have our solenoid mechanical locking and we have a magnetic locking. Guard locking switches require a safety rated signal to unlock the switch actuator. So you have timer relays on some, and stop motion detectors on others, like inductive sensors and EMF, EMF sensors or the EMF detectors. So interlocking guards, we're looking at here is our PSEN M lock. So this one when peaks, when meets the requirements of ENISO 14119, has safe interlocking up to PLE, SIL 3, safeguard locking up to PLE and SIL 3. Uh, the product version is based base version and series connection with or without power reset if required or desired. You have coded versions, coded, fully coded, and uniquely coded. They have LEDs on three sides to let you know how they're working, if they're operational or their issues. They have a safe holding force of up to 7,500 newtons and an integrated latching force of 30 newtons. They are a protective type of IP67. They have a connector, an MP12, which is eight pin. And there's an MP12 12 pin, which can be pigtailed if you required that. There's our auxiliary release on three sides, has a compatible handle module with integrated escape release and actuator, a com a compatible with diagnostic system safety device, excuse me, compatible with diagnostic system, a safety device diagnostics, the SDD. And then the emergency release, if required, and it cannot be used on versions with automatic reset. To look a little more at the PCNM lock, there's some information for you to look at if, if you should, if you desire. You get the, the we, excuse me, the PCNM lock, the switch actuator and units, the base version with power reset. Like I said earlier, you can get coded, fully coded, and uniquely fully coded. You got base versions with automatic reset. They can be coded, fully coded, and uniquely fully coded. You then also have the series connection with power reset. They can be coded, fully coded, and uniquely fully coded. And then a serious connection with automatic reset. They can also be coded, fully coded and uniquely coded. If required, you can also get one with a handle module. So for swing gates and sliding gates, 
with upward and downward cable outlet, they can be coated and fully coated. And we have accessories that can go with it, like handles, escape releases, insulation and accessories and cables, plug-in connectors and adapters. So interlocking guards. The safe interlocking and safe guard locking is one product. So the maximum safety can be up to PLE. It's got a high holding force of 7,500 newtons. Visual LEDs on three sides. There is a compact design if required, suitable amongst other things for all 40 millimeter profile designs. You have a long service life, robust housing, the mechanical robustness, so you can take a beating. A flexible actuator for a high tolerance compensation, even with sagging gates. So no inadvertent activation of the guard locking by the integral reset interlock. There's energy, energy, energy saving due to volt-free guard locking through the bistable magnet. And it's modular, complete solution that individuals to you, or is, is a modular complete solution that is individually made for you and for your needs. So the advantages and disadvantages of key operating switches and guard locking switches. The advantages, less space is needed with access control. So it could be low cost, tapper resistant, provides absolute protection if regularly checked and maintained. They come in wide ranges of sizes, unlocked only when the hazardous motion is, has ceased, Protect it, protects the operators after power is disconnected from continuing motion hazards, and protects machines and processes when a stop in mid-cycle could lead to a machine or product damage. Now, the disadvantages, additional maintenance is required for alignment issues, so it may require greater safety distance due to stopping time of the machine. Access can be difficult for maintenance or loading and unloading operations. And the key is a single point of failure that may reduce the protection provided, either by either someone uh, losing it or misplacing the key. So here's an example of hinge switches, different types that are out there. Some, some examples of limit switches, an example of how you can set one up for a safe, safe uh, circuit setup. Now, the advantages and disadvantages of limit switches and hinge switches. So the advantages, minimum alignment problems. So it's got a wide variety of actuators. They're difficult to defeat when mounted in positive mode. Less space is needed with access control for other safety devices. They are low cost, tamper resistant when installed correctly, and provides absolute protection if regularly checked and maintained. Now the disadvantages, it can easily be replaced with non-safety related limit switch. Access to the area can be difficult for maintenance or loading or unloading operations. Difficult to install, and large doors may allow access to the hazardous area before activating the switch. Now, non-contact safety switches and sensors, other types of safety interlocking devices are available that require no contact between the switch and the actuator, including magnetic switches, inductive switches, code transponder switches, and optical switches. So magnetic switches, advantages, minimal alignment problems, recommended for wash down areas, such as in the food industry. Less space is needed with access control with, than for other safety devices. They are low cost and provides absolute protection if regularly checked and maintained. The disadvantages, some can be bypassed with strong permanent magnets, must be automatically monitored to detect faults, and access to the area can be difficult for maintenance, loading and unloading operations. Coded transponder switches, here's an example of one in the area that it can look at or be used to monitor. The coded transponder device consists of three components, your coded actuator, a read head, and an evaluation unit. You have inductive switches. Inductive switches work like other industry prox switches or proximity switches, if you will. They're triggered by any steel, stainless steel, aluminum, alloy, or copper product. No special actuator is needed, so they can and unfortunately be bypassed if someone desires to do so. Now, coded transponder switches and inductive switches, their advantages. The advantages, minimal alignment problems, recommended for wash down areas. Less space is needed with access control. Provides absolute protection and regularly check and maintain. Also, also applicable for position sensing and low cost. Their disadvantages, must be automatically monitored to detect faults. Access to the area can be difficult for maintenance, loading, and unloading operations, and can be bypassed with any metal object. So installation is very important. 
Optical switches. Optical interlocking switches are used in place of traditional electromechanical switches to provide interlocking and unmovable guards. They utilize the same concept as light curtains, but light is transferred per fiber optic. Some examples here. Optical switches, their advantages. Minimal alignment problem can be used in hazardous locations. Can achieve up to CAT4. Less space is needed with access control. They are small devices. Can guard multiple access points with one controller. And provides absolute protection if regularly checked and maintained. Their disadvantages must be properly installed. Movement must be in access perpendicular to the optical path. They must be aligned properly. It must be automatically monitored for to detect any faults and the access to the area can be difficult for any maintenance, loading, or un unloading operations. Here's an example of some automatic screen doors out there in the industry. Some of you may have seen them. Now we're going to look at the present sensing devices, or PSDs, or photoelectric devices, if you will. A present sensing device, they detect persons and objects approaching or within the safeguarded area. Present sensing device must be positioned in respect to the approach speed of parts of the human body per, per ISO 13855 and ANSI B1119. The photoelectric or optical present sensing device, if you will, use a system of light sources and controls which can interrupt the machine's operation cycle when the light field is broken. The so types of photoelectric devices, you have light curtains, single beam systems, and area scanners. Mechanical stopping performance. So the, to effectively use a present sensing device, or PSD, the machine must exhibit the following stop performance characteristics. So initiate a stop upon receiving a stop signal from the device. No full revolution stops, no cycle completion. The stop time is consistent, limited, and stable. If the stop time varies, the worst case is used. So when you're determining the performance, these are your, your eyes, your, 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 the things that you would use to come up with your performance options. Light curtains and light curtain styles. So we've got some examples there on the right. Safety light curtains are photoelectric barriers composed of parallel in infrared or IR beams. Each beam is constantly monitored to detect for an object in the protected field. A stop signal is initiated when an object is detected. Light curtains can be used with mirrors to protect more than one side of the machine. Many types and styles of light curtains exist. Various housings, excuse me, various housings two or three box designs, various MOS, spacing between the beams, and different ranges, distances between transmitter and receiver. Some examples of, of light curtains out in the auto industry. Light curtains now, their advantages and disadvantages. Advantages, they, they protect anyone at the point of operation. Large protection areas are possible with one device can guard multiple sides with the use of mirrors, permits easy and safe access to hazardous areas for repetitive operations like loading and unloading, provides maximum productivity for frequent access operations, transparent to the operator, so no operator fatigue. Their disadvantages must be placed at a safe mounting distance, minimum safety, may require adjustment for specific operations when using blanking, and supplemental guarding may be necessary, and limited to machines that can be immediately stopped. Area scanners and area scanners operating principles. So area scanners are photoelectric barriers which utilize rotating lasers that, be that can be programmed to guard irregular shaped areas. So a stop signal is initiated when an object is detected in the danger zone. You can also have warning zones. They're also available to alert personnel when they are approaching the danger zone. So they will set off possibly an alarm, letting them know that they're getting close to the hazard. Here's an example of programming the area scanner and some of the designs that you may use. Some more examples of where you can place the area scanners to prevent access to these particular work cells. You can also mount them on AGVs or automatic guided vehicles. And this example here in this slide shows you where you would mount it on the AGV, the height, the calculations necessary to get the right uh, location. Now, the vision-based pr protect devices and area scanners, their advantages and disadvantages. Their advantages are to protect anyone in the hazardous area, protects large areas and, co and complex shapes with one device, 
provides warning zones to avoid unwanted machine stoppage, permits easy and safe access to hazardous areas for repetitive operations like loading and unloading, and may eliminate the need for mechanical guarding. Now, there are disadvantages. They are sensitive to polluted environments, such as dust and smoke. They are sensitive to reflections and lighting conditions. It's optimized for protection of large areas. They're more expensive than other presence sensing devices and limited to machines that can be immediately stopped. We also have radar-based protective devices. So they have three volumetric motion sensing, large and complex areas they can cover. Up to six sensors may be connected. They have muting possibilities, up to three separate muting groups, and configured, configure, excuse me, configurable warning B and detection zones. There's some examples here in the slide showing you how you can set it up to zones. So the vision-based protective device, the advantage and disadvantage. Their advantages are robust to optical and environmental disturbances, such as smoke, dust, sawdust, machine waste, drops of water, light, radio interference, oil, moisture, vapor, scratches, temperature, and such. They have a low metric detection, they're robust to vibration, no precise alignment needed, easy and intuitive configuration interface, not affected by objects left in the area. There are disadvantages. They, op they optimize for protection of large areas, limited to machines that can be stopped immediately, and intended for applications where optical sensors cannot be used. So pre they they pressure-sensitive devices, such as floor mats. So the uh, floor mats, the these devices, they provide a quick means of signaling to stop a machine can interrupt a machine's operating cycle when a force is applied to the device. Because pressure sensing devices cannot restrain an individual from reaching the hazardous area, in other words, it's not going to stop them from getting into it, these devices must only be used on machines that can be stopped mid-cycle. Some types of pressure sensing devices out there, we have safety floor mats, and you have safety edges and bumpers. Safety floor mats are pressure sensing electrical switches that are sensitive to, the, to both foot and vehicle vehicular traffic. The stop signal is initiated when an object is sensed in the danger zone. Now the advantages of floor mats or pressure, sens pressure de de sensing devices, they protect anyone in the hazardous area, protects large areas, low maintenance, provides visual reminder and warning to personnel because they can see it, permits easy and safe access to hazardous area for repetitive operations. Their disadvantages can be easily relocated, cannot, sorry, cannot be re easily relocated when machine is moved. They're expensive for large areas. Mats cannot be cut by user for new applications, so you cannot try to shape it to, for you what you need to make it work for. Take out valuable floor space. The surface beneath must be flat and limits the machines that can be immediately stopped. We have two-hand control and two-hand trips safety devices. Two-hand control and two-hand trips devices require the use of both hands at a fixed location, so removing the operator from the hazardous area. The actuating device requires concurrent activation within a specific period of time. I'll give you an example of 500 milliseconds by clause 11.9b, and for ANSI NFPA 79 to 2002, clause 9.2.5.6. So the individual hand controls must be arranged by design, constructed, or separation to require the use of both hands to activate the equipment. So they must be placed so that both hands are not next to each other and are touching it exactly at the same time. The recommended minimum distance of 23 inches between the controls is recommended. We also have enabling devices. Used when personnel must enter the hazardous area to perform work while allowing safe motion. Provide the margin of safety needed during troubleshooting, setup, programming, or servicing of a robotic or automatic work, automatic machinery when no other safeguarding means are possible or practical. Two hand controls are advantages and disadvantages. Advantages the operator's hands are required to be at a predetermined location during the hazardous portion of the machine, so they are not in the hazardous area. It can be adapted to multiple operations, no obstruction to hand feeding and does not require adjustment for each operation. Their disadvantages only protect the operator. Multiple, sta multiple stations must be supplied for multiple operators, and they're limited to machines that can be immediately stopped. Enabling devices. 
There are advantages and disadvantages. Advantages. Gives the operator control of the motion inside the hazardous area and built into all new robotic teach pendants. There are disadvantages. Only protects the operator. So if there are multiple people there, they have to have multiple devices. And the ergonomic issues of sustained activation can make themselves present. In other words, you can start feeling in your hands, arms, back. Now we're going to talk about emergency stop devices. Stop and emergency stop devices are not safeguarding devices. They are complementary. They're complementary to the guards, protective devices, awareness barriers, signals, and signs, safeguarding methods, and safeguarding procedures. A protective device detects or prevents inadvertent access to the hazard, typically without overt action by the individual or others. Now, since an individual must activate an emergency stop device to issue the stop command, usually in reaction to an event or hazardous situation, it neither detects nor prevents exposure to the hazard. So types of devices that can be used for e-stops, you have the push button, pull cord, foot operated, push bar, and rod operated. Emergency stop color code. So for IEC 60204 and NFPA 79-2002, emergency stop actuators. The actuators of emergency stop devices shall be colored red. The background immediately around the push button and disconnect switch used shall be yellow. The actuator of the push button operating device shall be of the palm or mushroom head type, and the red-yellow color combination shall be reserved exclusively for the emergency stop application. Here's some examples of bar tops, excuse me, body bars and trip rods and emergency stop pull cables. Some of these are, to be honest, are very antiquated, but they are still out there. Here is an example, the safe solution for your application, sensor and control technology. Here's a, a work cell and some safety devices that you may like to use in each and every of each and all the locations, from the access locations to visual actual access locations. It just gives you some ideas of what, what is out there and what can be used for what and when and where. And here's another example, a little bit more robust. So most, if not all, complete solutions will use a combination of safeguarding measures to guard against identified hazards. So remember that. Most, if not all, complete solutions will use a combination of safeguarding measures to guard against identified hazards. So there's more than one way to make safeguard your equipment. So that is the end of the presentation. I appreciate you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Maury, for that detailed and technical presentation. Um, several of you have already submitted questions. So let's dive right in. Um, but as a reminder, feel free to submit any other questions you might have um, to the queue. And please also take a moment to complete the feedback form that will appear on your screen at the end of the webinar. We have Regional Sales Manager Paul Singer on the line to help answer some questions. All right, so first up, are there any locking interlocks that can be used in hazardous locations, such as Class 1, Division 1. Trying to find the questions in your in the list here so I can make sure I've read it properly. I know. It's 22. Okay. okay. So we're probably talking about uh, this probably is dealing with a Class 1, Div 1 for an explosive uh, Device. I know there are, but I'd have to. I'd have to look into it. I don't think we believe we saw one off the top of my head. But if you want to, some of these are going to be a little tricky to answer. I've been reading them just because I'd have to see the exact scenario that goes with it. Okay. Um, well, we'll move on to the next one then. And if any of if this question, um, this audience attendee's question, um, feel free to. Um, to clarify or for any of uh, any of the rest of you, feel free to um, provide more details to help Paul answer these. Um, okay, so next up, if motors are still energized but the switches are off, is this considered OSHA compliant? 
orders are still energized, but the switches are off. Is this considered OSHA compliant? Um, my initial answer is going to be no, but I'm going to have to, again, look at the scenario to see what we're talking about, see what we're guarding against. These, these are, that one's, a, that one's a tricky one. My initial instinct would be to say no, but I could probably, you know, take a better look at it and see an example where it may be. Okay, sounds good. Um, next question. Um, what is the difference between the different types of coding? Different types of coding. That's referring to the uh, coded switches that we presented earlier. Uh, the different types of coding are the, the level of sophistication between what the sensor and what the uh, coded uh, actuator and the switch, what they'll work with. A basic one means that you need you, you do need a specific code to make the switch trip, so it's not going to be just a simple magnet. Um, on this basic level of coding, if I had 10 switches and 10 actuators, any actuator would trip any of the switches. They're coded to trip that particular model, but they won't. They, it doesn't not exclusive to that particular switch. As you up your level of coding, you get to a higher level, then you need a very specific coded actuator to trip a sensor. Uh, that means that if I pull two out of the box and I mix them up, one would not actuate the other. So it's very specific when you mount them, when you install them, you have the proper coded sensor. And then there's levels where you can reprogram it to teach a new one. So if something got damaged, you could, you could say, okay, I'll teach it to read a new coded sensor or an actuator, but it will only read that particular code. And then there are high level ones where the two that you get together have to be used. And if you somehow damage one or something happens to it, then the sensor itself, the switch won't actuate. You'll have to get a, a different setup. So that's the different levels of the coding. That's how, how high it is, whether or not it can actuate with a, a generic one that's coded for that or a very specific one. Okay, sounds good. Um, our next uh, attendee question is, what would you recommend for guarding on a CNC mill or lathe when operators need physical access to change tooling out or other repetitive processes. There are interlocks on the doors, but they have been bypassed to allow operators to reach into the machine's work area. Operators are not using physical access while the machines are rotating and milling material. Um, almost sounds like a trick question because it says in the middle there, um, there's interlocks in the doors, but they have been bypassed to allow operators. So that means that they were set up on a higher level. What I picture there is that it's designed such that the doors must be closed in order for it to to actuate. And if that's the case, then you've kind of bypassed your safety. Um, if you're looking at what would it take to to allow the door to be open, allow the operator in there to reach in the machine work area, then you're going to have to get into making sure that all the motion is stopped and all the safety protocols are there, which is going to be a different type of uh, scenario. We'd have to come in and look at it. You know, if we come in and look at this and we say, oh, this has got a safety system on, it's designed the door to be closed and everything operates, and then you open it and it's stopped, that means it's it's working fine. But if it's somehow been bypassed, then you've defeated the safety. So, you know, somehow during the on-site assessment, if we did a risk assessment on something like that, we'd look at it and say, okay, this, this is either compliant or it's not. So if we've taken that... Um, to get into a, a guarding uh, CNC mill or lathe uh, when you need access, now you'd have to go in to do your actual safety control circuit. It would have to be designed such that you can allow operators in there, allow people in there. That means you've taken care of and prevented all the dangerous motions and all that from happening. That would get to a little bit more than just the actual, the actual guard. So we can determine some of that through, through a, a risk assessment process or a review, a safety assessment. All right, next question. Oftentimes, when an AGV is utilized, it will have some type of housing mounted on top of the AGV. Does the camera allow for a vertical scan or only along the floor? Um, with camera, I assume we're talking about a, a laser scanner. It, it typically they go on one plane um, when it's mounted on the front when you're using a safety scanner on the front of an AGV or on the back it's, it's it's checking the path in and around what it's hitting what it's what's in front of it if you have something uh, type of housing monitor on top of it if you if you turn I mean whatever direction you point the scanner 
if it's sitting up at a 45 degree angle, it's going to detect on a plane at that 45 degree angle, but it's going to create areas where you can't detect something. If you create it, you know, set it so it's going straight up on a 90 degree angle to the floor, then it's going to create more of a barrier, but then it won't detect anything until it actually breaks that, which would actually be at the point that it's hitting what it's supposed to be stopping from. So usually um, any type of that mounted on an AGV is designed to be on a flat plane right out in front of it and behind it to check it. I don't know what your first instance type of housing on top of the AGV. Okay, next question. Um, are any safety devices triggered by high heat index environments? Let me see, which question is that? 26. It's triggered by high heat, high heat index environments. Um, I'll interpret this to ask if anything can be falsely triggered if there's a high heat index. Um, and you'd have to look at the individual spec. Anybody that's producing a safety device is going to have manufacturer specs on that for what the tolerated heats are, what it can work for, what it can't. And there, there are probably some that could be tripped if they were exposed to too high of a, a heat environment. You'd have to take a look at the situation, take a look at the actuator that's being applied in there. So whether it's during a risk assessment or just looking at the actual part selection, depending on the manufacturer, they're going to give you specs that will say yes or no, you know, what it can tolerate. If you're looking for something else, then um, please send me an email or something. We can go through it from there. All right. Next question. Can you provide more information on e-stop slash pull cords as it comes to self-propelled equipment, such as agricultural harvest equipment? Oh. Um, we could. I don't know of anything else. I have more information as does pull cords. I'd have to look into that. I'm not sure what we would say on that one. I'd have to talk to some of our experts on that. That's part of the problem with having a sales guy talk to you instead of our other ones. Um, that one, I'd have to I'd have to investigate that one. Okay. Um, next question. Are there any interlocked doors with removable keys for operators to take into the area with them to prevent startup from a third party, and when would this be a requirement? There are interlocked doors. We did talk about them a little bit with some of the trap key environment uh, scenarios where you actually remove the key and you take it in with you. There are different setups out there, different manufacturers make them in that concept where they actually, when you go in, you don't want the door to be uh, you want it to be locked behind you. So there are interlocked doors with systems like that where they can take it with you. Typically, a lot of the examples we show with the mechanical switch, you'll see that the switch is engaged, the door's locked. When it's unlocked, you pull it out, it, it's disengaged. But there are setups out there. You, you can look through different manufacturers to see if they have them. Um, you can determine when it's required, but based on some of the risk assessments and some of the scenarios in there. Typically in these, I mean, most of the things, you have to determine where, uh, how you want the motion to be prevented. Do you want it to be completely stopped before you go in, or do you want them to allow to stop everything just by when they go in there? So we could we can show examples. You can find examples with different manufacturers that do have a removable key system. Okay. Um, next question. Um, does the safety standard apply to robotic safety? Are you aware of any relevant, um, and then a follow-up question, are you aware of any relevant standards in Canada? Uh, the Canadian standards, uh, standards apply to robotic safety. There are relevant standards in Canada that I'm, I'm I'm not as familiar with them anymore. We have offices up in Canada that, 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 uh, that deal with that. Some of them do. I mean, some of these are global standards when we talk about them. So they apply. Some of them do have specific uh, country standards. You'll find that over time, most of these have become 
harmonious in that they word things such that one standard reflects what the other one intends. There might be little nuances, but if you check with uh, some of the safety manufacturers and safety providers in Canada, they can let you know which ones go from there. But I don't know them off the top of my head what the differences are. I haven't dealt with the Canadian standards in a while. Okay, next question. Are you familiar with design principles for control systems being Category 3 rated or safer um, per, per ISO 13849-1? Are you familiar with the design principles? Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure what the question is here. I mean, yeah, we, uh, we have a team of experts to deal with the standards. We sit on these standards as well, but I'm not sure what, what the question is here. Are you familiar with them? Yes, we are. I mean, we have people that are very uh, to be deemed experts on these. If you've got a specific question to something relating to uh, ISO 13849, then we can talk about it. I'm not sure what the question is here exactly. Okay. Um, next question: Are guarding solutions made of polymers acceptable? They are. I'd have to look at the situation and see. I mean, there are there are polymer guards out there. It would all depend on what we're trying to do with it, um, what we're trying to prevent, what the hazard is, what what the purpose of the guard is. Um, it has to do with you know visibility, has to do with reach, has to do with um, objects that could be extracted from the system. If there's a danger of that, then the polymer may not may not be acceptable in that. So we'd have to, again, determine through either a risk assessment or a safety assessment what that would do. So in general, they can be, but I don't know what the scenario is exactly. There's a lot of things to take into consideration and what the guard's trying to prevent. Because if you get into just the guard stopping somebody from going in there, maybe it's a physical barrier that works. But on the opposite side, anything coming out of the system, a polymer may not be strong enough to stop what's happening. And then it wouldn't be accessible or it wouldn't be allowed. Okay. Um, next question. Is there a certain height off the floor that a fixed guard must be kept at to prevent personnel from climbing under it? There is, and I don't know off the top of my head what it is. It's only a few inches off the floor. I mean, it's, I think it's changed over the years, and I'm sure there's people on the line that can answer this off the top of their head. But yes, you want to make sure somebody can't climb under it. I mean, it's, it's sometimes you look at it and go, it seems pretty obvious if there's a guard there, we don't want to get access to it. Um, and I myself might not be able to fit under a certain guard, but it doesn't mean that somebody else can't fit under it and get there. So there is one. You'd have to look at the type of machinery and what we're preventing access to and see what the standard is. But there, there is a certain height. It's only, I want to say it's around six inches, but I don't know the exact dimension that it is. Okay. Okay, next question. Um, we have a pressure sensing floor mat that gets oily and slippery. Do you know of any non-slip pressure sensing products or me or methods of cleaning this mat? Mm. Um, cleaning it, I you'd have to go to the manufacturer and see what they recommend. I mean, there could be, to get the oils and stuff like that off of it, could be damaging to the mat. If it's an industrial pressure sensing safety mat, it's probably built out of material that's rugged enough to withstand cleaning, but that doesn't mean you can get all the oil out of it. Um, I don't know of any non-slip pressure ones. Um, you'd have to look at the actual makeup of it. We used to sell some at one point, and I don't know what the rating was for, for slippery. If it's a super, super oily environment, then you're going to have a hard time finding anything that's that's going to be non-slip once it gets too oily. So I, I'd have to defer to whatever the manufacturer says on there. Uh, maintenance and what they recommend for cleaning it to see if you can extract the oil. And if it's too much, then it may have to be changed. Okay. Next question. Do you have any suggestions for risk evaluation on new in-house built equipment? And as a follow-up, are there any companies provide this evaluation that you know of? This is for risk evaluation on new in-house built equipment. Um, we do it. I mean, we we do we do risk evaluations and, and stuff like that on people on I mean, equipment all the time, whether it's uh, purchased from an integrator or purchased from a standard uh, OEM provider or sometimes in-house. Um, 
suggestion for risk evaluation, one thing would be to have somebody that, that is is a safety expert, somebody that can inspect the equipment, come in during the design phase and take a look at it. I mean, even a sketch and a simple example of what you think you're going to design and what you think you're going to build is a good time to prevent any real major problems. You know, we uh, Our people can look at it and say, well, I wouldn't do it like that. I'd, I'd put safety here, safety there, maybe a light curtain, maybe whatever, and make sure that you've got everything taken care of. If it's simply a matter of now the equipment's already built, we're running it, and we think we got to make it safer, then you'd have to have somebody come in and do a, a risk assessment, look at it, and then um, um, decide what was, you know, where the danger problems were, what could be. I mean, you know, any anybody, any competent party giving you a complete risk assessment is going to then hand you a uh, evaluation report at the end that says here's the per areas where there's problems, here's the potential dangers, here's the recommended solutions for fixing it. And recommended solutions may be, you know, add a guard, add a door, uh, add something, something, change this, do that. So there's there's a lot of that. We do it. There are companies out there um, besides us, obviously, that do this as well. So you just have to find somebody that is, is listed as a uh, – somebody can do risk assessments and services like that. Okay. Next question. Um, have there been incidents where actuators have failed to operate as designed? Um, probably. I mean, there's always uh, areas where they're – it may not be they failed where they uh, to operate as they designed. It may be that they failed to operate as intended when they were installed. Um, that's part of the problem is if you don't take a, a true look at how it's supposed to be applied, then you could have a situation where it fails. Um, you read things, and, and one of the tricks people get is when they read the word fail-safe, they figure that it's it's safe from failure, but what it actually means in fail-safe is that when it does fail, it will fail to a safe mode. So actuators, um, I mean, you could take one that breaks. If the actuator breaks off, if it's not designed properly, they, you could open up a door and the actuator stays in the switch and you didn't know it and the door opened. But if it's properly designed and properly applied and it's the right switch, then it will work as intended. So I would say that it's kind of a tough one there. They, 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 they failed to operate as intended, but maybe not as designed. But I guess we could dig deep enough and somebody could show you an incident. Okay. Sounds good. Um, and a related question, what maintenance do PILS actuators require? Um, depends on the actuator. I mean, there's not a lot of maintenance involved in them. You know, if it's a non-contact one, then there's really not going to be anything with it. They're designed such that they work if the switch is, you know, if it's opened up, the door's opened up, then it turns off. If the switch is closed properly, it... Uh, it works. Um, I don't know of any maintenance off the top of my head that needs to be performed as long as it's applied properly. Okay. Um, another related question. Do PILS actuators have a UL or FM or other type of certification? They do. Um, it would depend on the actual um, sensor, what we're talking about, what which one of our products they'll have a UL they'll have different ratings and and we can we can go through them and look at them um, if it's not you know they're on our website we can we can answer any questions you have about it typically what we're trying to do is see if a specific application requires a certification that we verify that the whatever we've recommended or whatever you're using does meet that you know, it would be more instance you could find one and say no that doesn't meet what you have but this particular one or this particular product does have the uh, ratings that you're looking for. So they do, but it would have to depend, it depends strictly on, on which exactly we're talking about within our product line. Okay. Um, and are PILS actuators rated and approved for hazardous atmospheres? Um, it would depend again on which one we're talking about and what we mean by hazardous atmospheres. If we're talking explosion okay. proof and intrinsically safe and stuff, um, possibly not, but I would have to look at the actual scenario to see what it's rated for. Okay. Um, you mentioned a powerful magnet can defeat the magnet interlocks. 
Um, are these RFID magnet interlocks that you're referring to? Um, and, uh, and also as a follow-up, can a magnet on a lifting attachment accidentally defeat a magnet interlock if it's too close? Um, I'm trying to see where he said that in the in the presentation. I mean, my initial answer is uh, the magnet lifting attachment actually defeat a magnet. I don't think so. I wouldn't think it would. Um, it's not just a simple concept of taking any magnet to trip any any sensor. But I don't know everything about every magnet on the planet to see if you could find one powerful enough. But uh, I'm trying to see if we can find out where it was said in the presentation. I think it's slide 36. Slide 36 was just pictures. Yeah. yeah. It's 36 in here. Okay. Some can be bypassed with strong permanent magnets. I'm not aware that any anything. I haven't seen it done myself, and I haven't seen any examples of that. But doesn't mean that there aren't some. And again, this this is showing some of our switches. But this, when you talk general magnetic switches. If they're not properly built and they're not properly rated, then that could be a problem where, where a very powerful magnet like that could be held up to it. But that's going to be a magnet that would be uh, that's getting into intentional uh, defeating of the switch. That's almost the same as saying, you know, if I pull all the wires up and jump them together, what happens? Or if I smash it with a hammer, does it still work? So um, I, 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 I'd like to talk more about that one, I think, if I could, but that I don't, it's, it's, I wouldn't say that it could just happen on a whim. Any magnet, any powerful magnet is not going to automatically trip one of these. Okay. Next question. What is the best way to verify interlocking switches, and how often should it be done so that production is minimally interrupted? Best way to verify... Um, Interlocking switches, I mean, a simple way to check interlocking switches is to, I say, assume we say interlocking, you're meaning they're, they're done in series. If you check them individually one at a time, then you're going to know if they work or not. If you if you open all of them and close all of them, then you do have situations where you can't get through them. I would say, um, again, it's going to depend on the switch. It's going to depend on a few factors, um, whether it's every shift. You know, a lot of times you'll see protocols put in place where they do it at the start of a shift. They go in, it takes only a minute to open and close each one and verify that they work. But it would have to be determined based on what was chosen, what switches are in there, and you know, the whole scenario. We can You could work out a strategy, if I'm reading that one correctly. Okay. okay. Um, and I think we have time for one last question. Um, if the work environment is too hot, is there a safety that prevents employees, employee access or equipment operation? Um, if the work environment is too hot, I guess you'd have to have a temperature monitor in there. And if we're talking about going into a hot environment, so if you've got something guarded, I assume the heat is inside of an enclosure and you want to make sure somebody doesn't go in there, you can put a, a safety measure in place to monitor the heat inside and then keep the door locked until such time that it's closed or prevent operation. I mean, it's the same as any other, uh, making sure all the safety protocols are in place. You'd have to get a safety rated uh, temperature reading sensor to check it. And if they did, then you could you could hook it up the same way, make the doors lock. It's a prevent access. So it would be a lock switch that you don't allow access until the criteria is met. Criteria could be the temperature is below a certain threshold. So it it could be done. All right. Uh, thank you. In here. We, talked um, er, we talked earlier about the height off the floor that's been put in by, by one of my colleagues. That uh, I was guessing six inches. It's seven inches, 180 millimeters is, is the requirement for the, the height off the floor for the guard uh, that it needs to be set at. So if you took my guess of six inches, you'd still be safe, but you have leeway to go all the way to seven inches. Perfect. Thank you for clarifying. Um, I'd like to... Uh, 
thank you all for attending. I'd like to once again thank our speakers, Maura Katz and Paul Singers, um, and for that great presentation. And I'd like to thank our sponsor, Pills. On behalf of EHS today, have a safe, healthy, and productive rest of your day. Take care, everybody. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.